particularly, you know, if we're getting these walk and talk messages. So, uh, yeah, I guess it's a little, little windy. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, so uh, moving on here, I'm actually gonna show you guys something really, really cool. So I live in sort of this like fancy, fancy-ish neighborhood here in midtown Manhattan. And I'm like the least important person around here. But they drive crazy cars. So you'll see one here, right here. It's a Lamborghini. I, I can't afford to pick up one of those yet. But uh, I think DML is working on it. <laughs> and so uh, anyway, we'll, we'll see one day. I wouldn't get the orange though. It's, it's, uh, it's a little gaudy, a little gaudy. Um, so anyway, uh, let's get into the news. I mean, for one, I thought this was pretty interesting. It seems like this news with the Russian hacking just cannot go away, cannot go away. I touched on it on Monday. It seems like it's just been an endless barrage of nonsense. It's totally unsubstantiated. But there was something that happened very interesting that actually pertains to uh, independent media, which uh, is that apparently the Drudge Report was attacked by a distributed denial of service attack. Now, it's complicated. You don't need to know too much about it. But basically, it's, it's an attempt to take down a website. And, you know, Drudge is probably one of the most important uh, websites on the Internet for, for conservatives. And they've been a big proponent of this story that, you know, the Russians were not actually behind the hacking. And uh, Matt Drudge, the guy that founded the, the website, came out and he actually said that uh, they have evidence or they, they believe that they have some evidence that points to the fact that it, it could be uh, the attack could be originating from um, the United States. So he thinks that there's a possibility that the United States government is actually behind attempts to uh, take down or at least uh, interfere with, with the Drudge Report. Um, if that's true, I don't need to tell you guys, that would be extraordinary. And on the, uh, I don't want to get down into too much conspiracy theory, but I trust Matt Drudge. And so when he says something like this, when he makes this sort of allegation, and he says that he has evidence to substantiate that claim, I'm willing to listen, especially with everything that we know from WikiLeaks. I mean, we know that Hillary Clinton lied under oath about sending uh, classified emails. We know for a fact that she lied under oath about that. Um, we know that you know she put her own national security, or she put national security below her own political expedience. We because you know why else would she send classified communications and, and, and emails that would uh, reflect on her time at the State Department in secret from a private email server? It was so that she could escape FOIA. So this is this is part of the course with the Obama administration. This is just the kind of stuff that that we've uh, learned to expect from them. So um, you know. I wouldn't put anything past him yet. Now I'm going to uh, pull up my cheat sheet here because we're moving along. And I'm actually, I've got a, a pretty cool thing that I'm about to walk up to here that I think you guys will, uh, will really appreciate. But the, the oh, well, hold on, let me show you this. This is the line for people who want Chinese visas. They want to be able to go to China to visit. You got to get in this line. So their immigration is much tougher than ours. If you want to come to the United States from a lot of places, you just, you just walk right in here. You just <laughs> you can swim the Rio Grande with a mariachi band on the t on, on, on the back of an elephant. You know, you can ride a donkey across the border to the United States. And uh, but no, no, if you want to go to China, if you want to go to China, you got to get in this line here. You get in that line. So um, anyway, uh, the next thing that I think is uh, pretty interesting uh, is uh, and this was this was big news. Yesterday, uh, Chuck Schumer, who is the um, uh, senator from New York and now leads the Dems in the uh, Senate, is um, uh, he said that there is a good chance that Democrats may block any nominee uh, that Donald Trump would put forward to the Supreme Court. That means that we could potentially go eight years, eight years, with at least one vacancy in the Supreme Court. This would be unprecedented, and frankly. I think that it might be a constitutional crisis. Um, you know, if Democrats move to block any sort of nominee, no matter how moderate they are, um, from uh, from the Supreme Court, and we're going to sit with a vacancy for potentially eight years, I mean, it means that basically the act of 
of the uh, of the the Justice Department. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not the Justice Department, of the, uh, the, the Justice Wing of Government just cannot get anything done. It means that big legislative decisions that, that you know, may need to be uh, count, uh, countered in court can't be brought up. Um, so that was, that was really pretty extraordinary. I think if Republicans had tried to do that, the response would have just been overwhelming. I mean, you, you saw that when Republicans made the relatively reasonable request to hold off confirming a new uh, Supreme Court justice until a new administration came in, whether it was Hillary Clinton or, or Donald Trump, people were up in arms, up in arms. So uh, moving beyond that, I saw this really interesting story, and this kind of speaks to my experience as a, as a Democrat, which is that, I don't know if you guys remember, but during the election, they spent so much time talking, and I'm talking about Hillary in the media, they spent so much time talking about the supposed ground game superiority that the Democrats had. They said that we're going to knock on more doors, we're going to get out the vote, we're actually going to move voters to the polls using micro-targeting and all these things. And it sounds really, really nice, okay? Obviously, it didn't come to fruition because Donald Trump walked away with probably one of the greatest strategic victories using a fraction of the money that Hillary Clinton had and a fraction of the data. But let's put that aside. I saw this news yesterday that the Democrats are pushing a story in the mainstream media that they built out a quote-unquote war room. They built out a war room to counter Donald Trump. Now, that sounds really, really nice. You know, it sounds like one of these things that Democrats love to tout that they're doing. They, they've got this operation to counter, you know, some, some adversary. But it actually means nothing. That means that they've set up a conference room. And, uh, you know, and, and they think that that's somehow going to... Uh, going to you know, help the American people. But what I know is that the Democrats have zero leadership. They've got zero plan. They've got zero common voice. The Democratic Party is in basically free fall. And until they come to the realization that they need to abandon corporate globalism, which is what they've, I think, been party to for a long time, putting, putting corp, big corporate interests, big money interests ahead of, um, ahead of, uh, uh, yeah, I'm gonna lower my voice. I see that, Dennis. <laughs> um, uh, you know, putting big corporate interests ahead of you know the interests of the middle class, they're gonna keep losing, and they're gonna keep losing big time. And I just wanted to remind you guys of some stats. You know, Democrats have this war room, which sounds really nice, but Republicans have the White House. They have 52 senators. They have 241 members of the House of Representatives. They have 31 governors. They have 32 state legislatures in total, and they split a few more. So, you know, the Democrats can tout these competitive advantages they think they have all they want, but all I know is that they're losing. They're losing the heart of the American people. They're losing voters that used to vote Democrat because it used to be that Democrats would stand up for the small guy. Not anymore. That's why you see so many big Hollywood actors. That's why you see so many billionaires lining up behind people like Hillary Clinton. And what do we give for it? What do we give for it? Um, here, I'm gonna take a quick break right here because I wanna show you guys something. Look at this here. This is from a period of time when America was great. And we, uh, oh, thanks Dennis, I see your, your message. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and we used to project American power responsibly and uh, and uh, you know, and this is a really cool museum here in here in New York, where they actually have a shuttle. It's back over there, uh, a space shuttle. They've got all kinds of great, um, you know, pieces of, of really American aviation history. So if you guys come to New York, definitely definitely check that out. Um, but getting back to my my little rant about how Democrats have have lost it. Um, you know, I I I think that what's so interesting is that. The Republican Party for a long time lost it, too. Until Trump, I felt like the Republican Party was rudderless. They were beholden to a lot of these big corporate interests. They weren't articulating a plan for America. I think this is why Romney lost in 2012. He was this vanilla candidate. He, was, he looked real pretty, looked nice on paper. But you know what? He didn't resonate with people. He wasn't authentic. He, he, he never articulated that plan to get America back on the right track. And Barack Obama in 2012 was probably one of the weakest candidates that stood for re-election in history. 
I mean, he had done basically nothing to get the economy back moving again. No, he, he inherited a bad economy, but he did nothing in those four years. Romney should have wiped the floor with him. But it took Trump, it took his honesty, um, to, uh, and, you know, it took, took his honesty and it took him speaking to people like me. You know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, a, I was a moderate Democrat. You know, I'm, I'm still socially progressive, but, you know, I believe in fiscal responsible, uh, responsive government. I think that, you know, uh, I think that, you know, we need to, um, you know, start renegotiating these trade deals. That's one thing that I liked about Bernie Sanders. I don't like all of his socialist message, but I like what he said about, you know, saying that these trade deals have disadvantaged the American middle class. It's true. It's like you're not making this up. That's why both there's commonality on both sides of the, 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 the aisle. And so what, what Trump's done that I love is he's broken down these barriers. He's created a, um, I think, a new Republican Party that spans both, you know, both parties, both political spectrums. It's not just conservative. It's not just liberal. Uh, it, it, it's a little bit of both, but not too much of either. And, um, and, and I, I think that this could uh, signal, um, you know, a, a rebirth in American politics. So um, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm excited about where we're going. Um, I was also really excited that he had the guts to stand up to Congress this week when they were going to gut an ethics, an important ethics body. And he, um, and he said, no, he said, you know, there, 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 there's a time to fix that. But you know what, right now, at this point, when America's in such trouble, let's not mess with, let's not play games. You know, we need to renegotiate these trade deals now. People are losing their jobs now. You know, people are flooding across the border now. ISIS is infiltrating and they're, they're engaged in propaganda now. So, um, you know, we can revisit all this later. We can play games later, but now's not the time. And that's the mistake that Barack Obama made. And that's why I couldn't support him again. Look, I voted for Barack Obama. Um, but here's the thing. As soon as he got into, um, into, 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 into power, he tried to um, play games. He was pushing this socialist agenda with Obamacare, which nobody likes. I don't, I don't, do you know anybody? Honestly, I'm going to read the comments right now. Do you know anybody that likes Obamacare? Um, I don't. I don't, I mean, they, they talk, they have these people on TV that say, oh, you know, it's, you know, it's great, whatever. But um, all I know is that my healthcare premiums were set to go up 50% this year here in New York. It's uh, just over 50%. Um, all I know is that I was getting inferior coverage. All I know is I lost my, my primary care physician. So it's a joke. It's a joke. Everything they promised never came to fruition with that. And remember that when, he, when Obama passed that piece of legislation, it was during the height of the economic crisis. People were losing, we lost, we lost millions of, literally, this is not an exaggeration, we lost millions of jobs during the first few months of the Obama administration and the last few months of the Bush administration. And what do they do as soon as they get into office? They try to socialize medicine, you know, <laughs> like, no, no, no. What I would do, you know, like if there's a hole in this boat, what would you do? What would you do? You'd go, would you go make a, a nice meal or uh, would you plug the hole? You know, <laughs> would you put it in a dry dock and would you fix the hole? You know, and, and, and that was, that's kind of the metaphor that I, I think uh, of, uh, you know, when, when, I, when I think of, of, of the Democrats. Um, and so, and, and that's what's so concerning is I still feel like they're playing games. They, they still don't get it. They really don't get it. That's why you see people like Chuck Schumer standing up and saying, oh, you know, we're not going to, uh, we're not going, sorry guys, I lost something here. We're not going to, uh, 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 you know, we're not going to prove any of, of Trump's justices. Um, you know, if a, if, a, if, if a Republican had done that to Obama, can you imagine what they would be saying? They'd be accusing uh, Republicans of homophobia and racism and sexism and all. I mean, just, just nonsense, just nonsense. Uh, but that's where we are. And so, you know, Democrats can talk about the ground game superiority they have and, you know, they, they can talk about all the, this nonsense, but, but all I know is, like I said earlier, the Republicans control the White House. There are 52 Republican senators. There are 241 members of the House of Representatives that are Republican. There are 31 governors, and there are 32 state legislatures the Republicans totally control. So the Republicans need to, I mean, sorry, excuse me, the Democrats need to wake up. They need to realize that it's not just the message. It's not just how they're articulating it. It's not just 
that, you know, the, the American people don't understand. The American people understand what the Democrats have been offering, and they don't like it. They don't want it. Um, and so that's, that's the, the, the fallacy that they've fallen for. The next thing I saw, and uh, I, I love the Democratic response to this, is, um, you know, obviously Ford decided to not relocate their, um, that, that, that plant to Mexico. They were going to invest over a billion dollars in this, in this plant down there. And, uh, you know, and what I find so interesting about the story, you know, they're, they're instead going to invest a few hundred million dollars in, in Michigan, of all places, a place that desperately needs it, actually a place that, you know, Trump won. And uh, Democrats are saying, oh, you know, Ford didn't do this because of anything, uh, you know, Trump is proposing. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. You know, in, in the run up to um, uh, in the run up to the uh, election, you know, they had indicated with absolute certainty that they were going to move this this plant to Mexico, that they were going to invest in Mexican workers instead of American workers. And so what changed? It was you have a president standing up and saying, if you do this, we're going to put tariffs on those imports. If you send these jobs to Mexico instead of investing in Americans, you're going to pay the price. And you can still sell your products here. That's fine. You know, we've got, we believe in the free market, but you're going to pay a price for it. And, um, and, and that's, that's all it took. It took a little, just a little bit of leadership. It took, a, it took a guy with the guts to stand up and say enough is enough. And, um, and Ford responded to that. You know, they, they're willing to play ball. You know, they, they can see the light. And, you know, and at the end of the day, it all comes down to, do, to, to dollars and cents. And that's what Trump gets. Trump totally gets it. He, he, he realizes that, you know, the, the threat of uncertainty, the threat of tariffs on their imports would make their products more expensive here in the United States. It would cost them more to build it in Mexico and bring it across the border than it would to invest in Americans and build it in Detroit. Um, so uh, hats off to Trump, and I just love the liberal hysteria that has come after that. So many of my friends on, on Facebook and Twitter are saying, oh, you know, Trump didn't do it, Trump didn't do it. Well, you know, I guess he didn't save those carrier jobs either, or it, I guess he didn't save the, those jobs at the Lincoln plant in, uh, <laughs> in um, in uh, where, where was it? In, there was another state too, as well. Um, so th this is th this is par for the course. They're going to keep denying his victory because if Democrats, and I'll tell you this from firsthand experience, if Democrats have to start acknowledging that Trump isn't so bad, that he's not a racist, that he's not homophobic, that he's not, you know, that he's not pushing this crazy agenda, that he's actually a pretty moderate guy and he's going to be a really effective, principled um, president. Uh, it, it'll make them come to terms with the fact that they have been wrong for a long, long time. A long time. So, um, anyway, that, that uh, oh, yeah, we've got some people from Michigan here. That's good. That's good. You know, and, and another thing that, that, that scares me, and I'll, I'll just mention this real quickly, is I've been reading a lot about this push to automation. And, um, and I'm, I'm hearing so little of it out of, um, uh, out, out of Democrats. One thing that really scares me is I, I see that, that um, you know, the, I'll give you a story. The company that manufactures all of Apple's iPhones, it's not Apple, no. They contracted out to companies that, uh, that manufacture it for them. And there's one big company called uh, Foxconn, and it's based in Taiwan, but they have uh, enormous manufacturing capacity in, um, in, in China. They are the largest manufacturer of electronics. And um, they... Uh, they, ha they are one of the world's leading investors in automation. And why does this scare me? It's because I've been reading studies about how these great paying jobs from car manufacturing to you know, driving a taxi, to driving an Uber, to driving a, you know, a big truck, these jobs are on, in, in the near term are going to be automated if we don't stand up now and say that we need to protect these American jobs. And so um, I, one thing that I'm gonna be pushing for, for Trump to start paying attention to is this question of automation because there's no question. Trade deals like NAFTA and TPP gutted the American middle class in the last 20 years. But what's going to gut the American middle class, if we're not careful, is this push to automation. And so let's, let's not dwell on the past, let's correct for it, but let's focus on what these threats to you know, the future stability of the American middle class are. Um, and uh, with that, um, you know, I, I had a, a great time uh, with you guys today. 
uh, and I don't have the, uh, you know, this is harder than it looks. So hats off to Dennis. He's, uh, he's a machine. He does this every day for an hour. And I know you guys love it. Um, I love it. I watch it too. Um, but it, you know, it takes a lot to, uh, to, to, to do this. So uh, it's not as easy as it looks, but I hope that the video is a little bit better today. I, I know that the mic's a little bit hot, so I hope that that wasn't too bad. Guys, don't forget to follow, um, uh, Dennis is my dad on Instagram that's uh, run by Dennis's daughter it's really 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 good I love it um, it kind of gives you this behind the scenes look at, at, at who Dennis really is um, and uh, you know and, and I also wanted to mention that um, uh, you know Dennis, that I, I remember this, this time when I think really Dennis and I bonded um, and it was the last day he was going to be at Newsmax and, uh, and he was fed up because they were trying to censor him and, and he's a principled guy and he wasn't going to take it. He was not going to take it. He was not going to sit there and have somebody who was ostensibly uh, a mainstream media guy masquerading as an alternative media guy telling him how to report. And uh, so Dennis said, I'm, I'm going to go do my own thing. I'm going to build something bigger and better than this. And when I saw this unfolding, I pulled out the phone and I started live streaming this thing. And it was one of the most epic, I, 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 gotta, I gotta find it, I hope we can still find it. It was one of the most epic manifestos. That was, I feel like that was Dennis's manifesto about what he's building right now. Standing up to the powers that be, he's had enough. Um, so, so we're gonna find that. And I, I, I was glad to be a part of that. I felt like I was part of history. So um, anyway, Scarlett will be back tomorrow. I had a great time with you guys. Follow uh, Dennis is my dad on Instagram. Download the app on the uh, Play Store. I think the iOS app is coming up soon. And uh, it was great being with you guys.